Okay, so it's early morning, the Saturday after CES, and we're sitting here in the rental car, driving to Boulder, Colorado, to visit PS Audio. Um, we're gonna do a factory tour, we're gonna interview company founder Paul McGowan, and we're gonna end the visit with listening to some of the rec my recordings in his dedicated listening room, which features the legendary Infinity IRS-5 loudspeakers. It's going to be quite a day. Hey, are you from New York or something? <laughs> Hi, Paul. Hi, John. So Paul McGowan, the founder of PS Audio. Come on in. Hold the door open for you. Whoa, so, there's some classic pieces here, Paul. <laughs> yep, and this, actually, up here, I'll show you. This guy with no silk screening was our very first product. That's a little phono preamplifier. And inside of it are a pair of um, 709C op amps. And those were used to make a phono stage. And later, these products kind of grew and you can see the, the progression here. They became bigger, they became discrete. Instead of using op amps, we use discrete op amps. We use uh, transistors that are separate. And then later we created the other half of the phono preamp where you have a knob and a volume and, a, and, and the selector switch. So between these two, you'd form a complete preamplifier. And so that's sort of a, how the company got started. And then it progressed in stages over the last 45 years. There's a lot of history here. Yeah, the Ultralink, that was a favorite of Sterophiles when we reviewed it. Um, that's one of the few that actually has a glass cover on it. So you can see inside. And that was made by Ultra Analog. Yes, yes. Richard Powers. Yes, he passed away. I think. Richard passed away. Yes. Yeah, he did. And then power plants. If I remember the first one you did, the 300. That Richard. was in 97. Yeah. I mean, what is this? this? That beast down there is a real ball breaker. It's, it's called the P1200. And it is basically two P600s that it's, a, it's an AC regenerator, takes the power out of the wall, converts it to battery voltage DC, and then regenerates new power. And that's the biggest one we ever made. It, it is, it's huge. You can, uh, you can gauge it by me. You're not going to pick it up for I'm not going to pick it up. It's about 150 pounds. And that's a big beast. So there's a lot of history here. And... I'd love to show you guys the new PS Audio and how we do stuff. You want to head over to my place? Yes, let's okay. go to your office, Paul. Come on. This is engineering here, but we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. A lot of cool stuff. You, you look like you're crowded in here. <laughs> we, we are really crowded. We're trying to find a new building to, to fit into. But come on in. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> it's kind of cluttered in yeah, here. I know, I know. So uh, don't tell my wife, Terry. Hopefully she'll never see this video. So Because I'm supposed to, she said, with specific instructions, come down there, clean up your damn office, and then show it off. But I didn't do that. So <laughs> this is Paul's den. Please forgive the clutter. Over here is a little studio where I can do podcasts. And I have a two-way communication with this microphone that I can do podcasts. And then when I want to set up for a Paul's video, <coughs> I just pull the chair over like this, and I sit over here and yap, yap, yap. And that's, that's my little video studio. And this is where I just answer emails on a constant basis. I average two to 300 emails a day, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of that going on. If we swing over here, this was supposed to be the CEO's magnificent office and all I got out of it was really a couch. Um, if, if you come over here, because we're so cramped, I had to give up part of my office to turn it into a video studio. So this is how we shoot product photos. This is called a view camera. And on the back of it, this is, a, this is an old fashioned kind like Ansel Adams used to throw the, the, the cloth over his head. But this one actually uses a digital back and I can view it on the iPad. So that's kind of my office, and um, 
if you want, we can go take a, a tour of the rest of the place if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be All great. All right, John, lead the way. What is? What are the numbers on the wall? <laughs> Is that, is that, that's the number of people who are using PS Audio DAX right now. Right, right. And, and when it hits five, the entire place explodes. <laughs> this is our sales office, and that's the daily total that they have booked when they, when, they, when they book a sale. And then if you look over here, I won't bang it because it'll probably break your camera, but when we hit certain goals, we bang that. Do, do a little one. Yeah, there goes her VU meter, just went, no! Oh! <laughs> and we can fix it in post-production. Okay, yeah, okay, thanks. So this is, this is engineering. So the heart of our company is all based in engineering. More than a third of the people employed here are engineers or involved in engineering. And this is uh, hardware engineering. So we have two, two hardware engineers. We've got programmers. This is the kind of the programming office in here. We've got uh, three programmers. And okay, take a look at this, John. There's a breadboarded circuit, so that's going to be a future product, I guess. Yep. Well, look at the transistors hanging. Yes. It, I'll go around and show if you're actually interested in that. See these here? So these, those are transistors. Those are power transistors, and if they do too much without a heatsink, they'll burn up. This is our chief engineer's office. That's Bob, right? Bob That's Stather. Bob. Bob Stather. He's been with us for forever, and Bob's a really bright engineer. And then over here is programming, and then here is the lab. And engineers are not known for their, their tidiness, and we certainly don't encourage it. Um, once in a while, my wife, Terry, will come through and yell at everybody to clean it up. But essentially, this is a place where we do all, all the work. One of the things John and I were talking about that really doesn't make us happy is that most of the circuitry today has to be looked at through a microscope. It's called surface mount technology, and they're really, really tiny little things. And when John and I were raising up, I hate to talk like two old guys, well, but... Well, I remember the 709 op amp. I made stuff with it as well. Did you really? Now, you know it had a Class B output stage, right? No. Well, I remember you had to use <coughs> external co compensation. Otherwise, right, it would be unstable. Right. It, Stan and I worked for nearly six, seven months trying to get that 709C op amp to sound the same as a product back then. I don't know if you remember, called the Quintessence. No. Mm -hmm. So they use 709C op amps, and theirs sounded better than ours always. Quintessence preamp. Yes. Yes, I remember seeing remember that. Show. Yeah. Great sounding preamp, made essentially the same circuitry that we had. And it wasn't until an AES in New York where we discovered their secret, which is they ran a small amount of DC bias. Oh, to, 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 to keep the output stage turned on. To keep the output on. stage turned on, because it was a Class B output yeah. stage. And then, and then the 709 was replaced by the 741, which was internally compensated, and everyone went, it was a hooray, dog. but it sounded awful. It was horrible. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it had, what, a slew rate of about... You know, a week. A, a week, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a slew rate of a week. I like it. Yeah. There's some nerd humor for you. Now, that's, that's interesting, Jana, that um, they have one of the latest Audio Precision 5 series analyzers. That's for production line testing? This, this particular one is just strictly for engineering. Uh -huh. um, and they set up all the production testing here. And then we have multiple 5 series around the building so that the tests can be automated. Yeah. And they, they decide what. And then this is special equipment that we build that is controlled by the audio precision. Right, so it switches the loads as you need to 8 ohm, to 4 ohm, to headphone, whatever. Yep. So then you just run the automated test procedure. And, exactly. and then I think when it all is good, that little green light comes yep, on. Yep, the little green light comes on. And then uh, if it doesn't work, the, the, little, the, the little red light was on. And I, I don't know if we have time for just a quick little story. It, if, if, if it, mm. A friend of mine was telling me about red light, green lights, and a company that I won't name was manufacturing tweeters in China and all of a sudden they had this huge uh, defect rate and they couldn't figure out why it was and they sent an engineer, he spent about a month looking at every single parameter what they were doing and at the very end 
he noticed that they had this simple go no go test. They would put the tweeter in, close the door, run it, green light, red light. Every time the green light went off, the technician would pull out, put it into a box. Pull out, put it in a box, just like he should. Then one of the tweeters was defective and the red light came on and he pulled it out, put it in the same box. <laughs> and <laughs> the engineer said, I think I found the problem. <laughs> and it turned out that they, they, were, they had not written as part of the SOP, the standard operating procedure, they had not written in what to do when it turned red. So they just assumed that it did something and put it in. So we all have to be careful with these red light, green light tests to know that if it is a red light, what are you going to do about it? So at least our technicians are a little more skilled than than somebody just sitting on an assembly line. And we can, if you want to, we can go, do you want to go look at production? Yes, because this room produces a product which is going to be manufactured. Exactly. So yep. making more than one is the next step. Making more than one is the next step. And, and just briefly, our process is, you know, we dream up the products, we prototype them, We'll put them on here, we <coughs> test them, make sure that they measure up the way they do. <coughs> and then they go into the listening room, which we'll take a look at later. And they're voiced. And changes are made to the circuitry to make them sound the way we want. <coughs> Excuse me. And then they come back, get retested, and finally they become a product. So come on along and I'll show you where we make them. Okay. And that's more engineering through there. That's the uh, director of engineering in that darkened office. It's a Saturday, sorry. <coughs> Back into the admin offices. One of my favorites, my buddy Nipper. I looked for a long time to find a big Nipper. This was actually out of a record store and I managed to grab it for, mm, it wasn't cheap, but Nipper the RCA dog. So, in here, you can see the first of two production areas. And in here is where we do all of our DACs, and our, our sources, anything that we do with phono stages, um, preamps. So this is a stellar preamp, but it's just, you can see it's just the chassis and there's not much else to it. <coughs> so if it's a preamp, it's kind of built here, unless it's a BHK, which we'll see in a minute. Yeah. Do you have, <coughs> I, I forget what it's called, is it a quality circle where an operator takes basically a kit of parts and makes something yes. and then signs it so he or she is responsible for it? Yes. So that gives people pride in, the, in what their work, what they produce. That is exactly the way that we do it. And you'll see, if you, if you look when you buy a new piece of PS gear, yeah. you'll see that it's signed off by the person who actually built it. Yeah, the opposite is production line, but then no single operator has responsibility for, exactly. for the quality. Exactly. And we tend to have people who uh, pride themselves in specific products. Mm -hmm. Like one of our, our, our guys over here, Shoah, is responsible for almost all the BHKs, which we'll see in a minute. And he's just, uh, that guy knows how to build a BHK. Yeah. <clears throat> I probably couldn't do it if my life depended on it, but. And here, these are, this is going to be a perfect wave DAC. And you can see, but <clears throat> inside there's just parts where they're collecting them up. So all of our, everything that we make here is locally manufactured. So all the metal parts, with few exceptions, these corners being an exception because they're cast and we can get castings done overseas a lot cheaper. And some of the top covers that we do, these, not many people know this, but this top cover, as you can, you can see, see how shiny and beautiful mm -hmm. that is? That's actually MDF, which is uh, medium density fiberboard, it's wood. And they, they put a piano coat on here and then hand polish that. And we do get that um, out of China because we've tried to have this done locally and it was in the order of five to $600 each mm -hmm. if they could even do it. So they, and then over here, then you have a, that's our air compressor turning on. <clears throat> so all of that, uh, those particular things are done overseas, but everything else you see in here 
from the metalwork to the painting to the circuitry uh, are all done locally. Here's a stack of stellars over here you can see, and this is where everything gets tested. Do you do 100% testing? We do 100% testing. Every single piece goes through the, the entire test procedure. Here's another uh, 5 series. Mm -hmm. Audio precision. Sorry. Yep. I was, I was, so, did you have a, a burning rack where you kind of just let stuff yep. be powered up yep. for, for like a few days? So then to seek what do they call them? Child mortalities. Right. In the next room. So mm. on on stuff like this where we do DACs, we don't burn those in. Those are tested, boxed, and shipped. We've never found an advantage to burning those in. Mm. On the power products, the power yeah. plants. Um, the, uh, uh, strangely enough, the transport and uh, the preamps and things and the power plants, those are all burned in for quite a long time and actually there's a computer generated system that abuses them, puts yeah. different loads on because them. Because if a, an output transistor, there may be one which is just close to being out of spec Yep. and this is going to reveal that. Exactly. But here, the number of tests that DAX and things go through uh, are, are extraordinary. So. If you take a product like this, that's what which, a new wave. Uh huh. That's a new wave phono converter, and these boards. This is all surface mount stuff. These boards in here will have been tested four to five times before they ever even get into the box. Mm -hmm. So all we're really testing at the end of the day is whether the the boards together as a system operate yeah. the way they should. And your boards are locally sourced as well? Yeah, so these come from Kansas, which mm -hmm. is sort of local. Um, yeah, one state over. Yeah, one state over. So those come from Kansas. Some other boards, like power plant boards, come from Longmont, Colorado. And, but they're still all local. And, and this is the inside of a Stellar. <coughs> That's a Stellar gain cell DAC, which is our affordable um, gain cell product. These are the analog gain cells. And then this is all manufactured locally as well. The power transformer. We still believe in big power transformers. This thing draws so little current, it could run off a little weenie transformer, but it just doesn't sound as good. Mm -hmm. So we, we pay particular attention to the magnetics. Yeah. And you look at the display on, on the direct stream DAC, familiar all 1K at minus 20. It's yeah. like, oh yeah. <laughs> <coughs> John's seen that before. Oh, many, many times. It's your old, you know, your fundamental test signal. Yep, and, and here's where, so you can sequence, that's a sequence report that yeah. comes out of the, the audio precision. And over here they're building, I think this is going to be a, what is this? Looks like some kind, this, oh, because we're launching a new product called the P20. They're doing some extra work where normally it would be done next door. So there's a front panel of a P20, and you can see inside with the display. Normally this would not be here. <coughs> this particular technician is just doing the work. Yeah, and that's an AC regenerator product. That's an AC regenerator, exactly. And these are, that's a transport. So come on next door and we'll show you. Oh, this is one thing that we, <laughs> we were talking about. It's not all that exciting, but it, it's our hardware bins well, and I, I see this one's empty yep and if if you didn't have any of those your production stops it's totally dead we, we do not produce that product that so day. that one's when's that one going to be restocked <laughs> <laughs> good question as I was telling John we have actually a, a guy a service that comes in here and he takes care of all the stocking all the fasteners and so I imagine these will all be filled on Monday yeah and he's he's pretty good about it, but but it's something I presumably I mean, people like me, audiophiles, we don't think of this mundane stuff like, but the fasteners which hold everything together, you have to get them. You know, yep. the transistors, the integrated circuits. That's the glamorous stuff, but this is actually just as important when you're manufacturing. Yeah, if you don't put those screws in, it doesn't work and it won't hold together, and and we can't send it out the door, so it stops you as much as even the glamorous part. <coughs> This is our power area, and here's where we take big things like this, this massive heat sink, and you know, feel that. So, <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> but these, these are, one of the things we learned about heat sinks long ago, and, and much of this is just experience, is that 
the the amount of mass is more important than the number of yeah. fins. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a thermal capacity. It has to be there. Exactly. So we used to, you know, years ago before we hired experts to help us with that, we just thought, well, it's just surface area. Mm -hmm. And the more surface area you have, the more heat gets dissipated, which is, it, which is true. It's but if, yeah. Yeah, if you can't have enough mass, uh, thick, heavy metal that will absorb the evenly the heat from the transistors then one of them can get real hot before this can dissipate it so just little things like that that you wind up learning over the years that make this sucker so heavy mm. are really um, are, are pretty critical back there is the the so we have a full-time person that manages just the inventory we have two full-time people that do the purchasing so i mean it's a three-man team just trying to keep everybody stocked in parts. Yeah. How many people work here all together? 38. I think 38 people. Are, we're, we're almost up to 40. We don't really have any more room to squeeze people in. <laughs> so it's running a company can be challenging. This is, oh here, this is interesting. This is part of the back panel which you can see all the plugs on here. So this is the new P20 which is the new power plant P20. And you can see we distribute the power through these gold bus bars. These are thick uh, copper bus bars that we gold plate so they don't corrode. And then these are the individual relays which turn on and off the various zones that you see here that you can control over your phone if you want or Right. Why, why anybody would want to do that, I don't know. Well, it's just I see there's, there's an Ethernet port on the back. Yep. I'm old enough to remember when audio <laughs> products couldn't be networked. <laughs> that, that's a holdover from the home theater days yeah. when, when the home theater installers wanted to be able to reboot their customers' products so they didn't have to make a service call. Oh. And, on, and, and because we had the Ethernet there, we then built a web page where you can go look at the quality of your power and we thought, well, now, you know, audiophiles don't really care about that. We thought about pulling that off. There was hell to pay for that. Yeah. I mean, they went berserk. And, you know, and it turns out it's a feature people love. So yeah. we've just kind of kept it. We walked past an office earlier, and that's where you have two programmers working full time. Full time, yeah. Two full time programmers. Our director of engineering is a, a, a programmer that we pulled from Seagate. He was the he he led the the Seagate the Seagate which is a hard drive company. Yeah. He led their their programming team. So when you and I got started in this thing, there was no such thing as programming. No, I mean there it was silly. You 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 made parts. They worked. First thing I ever programmed was a five 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 timer. Yes, that blinked the the the, the LED on the front panel. Yeah. <laughs> And, and that's my extended program. I, I had a, a similar experience. I, I remembered a 555, I built some circuits with it, but the first time I, I ever wrote and compiled a machine code instruction which would flash a pixel on and off in the middle of the screen, it was like, wow. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> just, exactly. I think I did one better on my Adam Coleco. Oh yes. You I remember mean, that yeah. with the, the, the twin cassette drives? Yes. I actually made a, a spaceship travel. I made a field of stars yeah. and I made a, a little ship go across it and I was as proud as I could be about that. Yeah. And that was all done in basic. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, oh boy, we're sounding like a couple of geeks. Yeah. Well, all the, all the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the programs I use in my test work, like for calculating output impedance and so on, I wrote them all in Quick Basic in the 80s and Dow just run them. I run them in a DOS window on my Mac. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. So, this is where we build the power amplifiers, the BHK pre amplifiers, and all the power plants. And this, you were talking about our burn in. Yeah. So, there's burn in racks there behind us. And then this area here oh, is, so these, is are, these are dummy loads these are the dummy loads and this is the computer that runs them and we plug you can see all the plugs and things and we plug those in and it stresses out the power plants yeah. and every product has a traveler a, a report on uh -huh. its performance yep yep yeah you can see over here and it tells you who who's working on it who built it um, what its measurements are so those travelers are, are important and we try and keep pretty good track of, of things because, you know, the number of products that we, we release out of here are not insignificant. 
though you know quality is always something that that every company strives for but you have to you know mistakes are going to be made so you have to keep track of them these this is a BHK uh, I can't see without my glasses <coughs> oh this is a BHK 300 the mono amplifier yeah. and you can poke in here uh, Jenna if you want to yeah, missing its tubes missing its tubes yeah, this is what we reviewed this I think what 18 months ago in the magazine. This is Bascom's this is Bascom's Pride and Joy. Yeah, BHK Bascom H King. Legendary yep. designer. He is a legendary designer. <coughs> and he would not come on board as a PS audio designer unless we allowed him to put tubes in the front end. And in the 45 years that we've done PS audio, this is these are the first products that we've ever had tubes and we've all loved tubes but never put them into a, a product and there's a, a, a great story that I and th this is I don't know what the red tags here for but that's the tube stage you can see on that and so my deal with Bascom was okay <clears throat> I'll agree to that we're gonna work on this power amplifier and we'll build two circuits one will be this tube circuit, and they all run on the same voltage, and another will be this same thing, but we'll, we'll build it up through high voltage MOSFETs that plug into this tube socket. Mm -hmm. And whichever one sounds better, the high voltage MOSFETs is the input stage, or the vacuum tube for the input stage, becomes the product. And if it turns out to be the MOSFETs that Bob Stadther and I designed, then you have to eat your words, and we're not going with tubes. And Bascom said, done, I'm in. So, <laughs> you know what? Well, we have vacuum tubes on the <laughs> output, sorry, on the input stage. And it, it was no contest. When we went to the listening room and we, we experimented, and I wasn't told, none of us were told, here's A, <clears throat> hang out, here's B. And oh, whatever it was, was clearly better. It was the damn vacuum tube, so. Oh, well. and. <clears throat> These are the preamplifiers over here. They too have vacuum tubes. And so that's a BH, there's a stack of BHK preamps. These are all the, the tubes. We buy these particular ones. What are these? I don't know where we buy these. We get some from Russia and some from China. And even though it's a preamp, you have a massive toroidal transformer. Yes. Can you see that, Jana? And I remember in your, your e-newsletter, some time ago you were saying in your early days of PS <coughs> Audio you used a regular size transformer then yep. you replaced it with a bigger one and then a still bigger one yep. and then a still bigger one and even though it was way over specified for the current demands of the circuit it kept sounding better exactly. the bigger you made it. Yep, yep and that's not <coughs> that's nothing that we've actually fully explained yet other than the the heavier gauge wire the lower DCR. Yeah the, the lower power supply impedance. Yep but eh, it's just one of those things. It's just one of those things that we hear, and it's easily demonstrable, easily repeatable. Yeah. And oh, believe me, if I didn't have that, these are expensive. If I didn't have to have this expensive thing, I wouldn't put it in there. And and we could still charge the same price if it sounded the same <laughs> and mm. make more money. But that's not the way it works. So power transform. You can see. Look at the size of the transformer in here. So that's that's a BHK. And now that's required because there you're trying to put out a certain amount of energy. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense. You know, I, I think, John, you would agree with that. But the, the, the low-level stuff, to have it be so needy for a big transformer is, is something that still has me scratching my head. It, it must have something to do with keeping the ground clean because... Your assumption is that the ground is at you know, zero potential and that everything gets soaked up there without any impedances to, and to, for noise to develop across, but maybe what you're doing with providing such a low impedance front end for the power, you're just keeping the ground cleaner. That I, could well I, be. I mean, that's conjecture. That's well, yeah, no, no, it, it, uh, it, it could well be. Obviously, you know, ground is the center point of that, of that transformer. Yeah. And it, that could well be. We've never fully explained it to where I'm, I'm satisfied as an engineer that, yeah, that's clearly why it is. Mm -hmm. But it's easily demonstrable. And we've tried everything from 
changing the way that, you know, some people have said, oh, well, that's because you don't know how to design a, a, a regulator circuit or mm -hmm. you didn't do a very good job. And we've tried all manner of stuff, and every time, the bigger the transformer, the better it sounds. Yeah. Up to I a mean, point. when I look at noise floor analyses when I'm testing products, you know, you see they're very low in level. They're like minus 100, minus 110. But there are, there are products at 120 and 240, 360. Okay, that is due to the um, full wave regulator power supply noise that's coming com that is contaminating the ground. You see 60, 180. Well, that's from leakage from a transformer that's being probably mm -hmm. picked up by something steel somewhere in the circuit mm -hmm. with tubes, obviously the pins. So I'm, I'm just start thinking, well, maybe that's what's going on with when you're using a bigger and bigger transformer. You're just making the ground cleaner and cleaner. Yep. I don't know. But uh, I think it's 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 that plus the lower impedance, yeah. um, which we've always found s makes it sound better. That could well be. Yeah. yeah. Maybe John just shed light on a uh, something we've been struggling with for no, 30 you, years. You know this stuff, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, I am always open to learning, uh, for sure. So we can just, uh, if, if you want, I'll move over here. <coughs> we, this is where we finalize the products. There's a little conveyor there that they go out into shipping. They get boxed up. And they get high potted first. We run everything through a high pot test that checks to make sure there's no, we put like 10,000 volts through um, through the system in a burst to make sure there's no ground faults. Okay. Um, and it's part of CE. It's We're required to do it. Mm -hmm. But it, if there is a ground fault, it can be pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes back here. <laughs> so yeah, the high pot test can be interesting. But come on along, we'll go out into the warehouse and I'll show you the sound room. Okay. So through these doors is our glorious warehouse. Nothing more exciting than that. So this, this stack right here are getting ready to be boxed up and put into their, you know, cleaned up and boxed and all that. And then if you want, behind you is where inventory is these shelves have all the inventory lined up for the builds. One of the struggles of any company is inventory level. So you don't want to run out of parts, as John mentioned before, because if you do, then your production stops and, and customers are angry and our chief financial officer is even angrier because there's, there's no cash to pay anybody, right? But the other problem, so you could say, well, we'll just get you know scads of inventory. But the problem with that is then that if you have too much inventory it chews up all your cash and as a company it's always a balance between how much cash you want to have sitting out here in parts so, so for instance when you look around here there's a million dollars in raw parts sitting out here and that's a lot of money and it's continually turning over so we try and turn our inventory every two months we're not always successful at it but we try, so it's it's a real challenge. That's six tons a year. That that's that's quite a lot. I think if company, you can do it, yeah, some companies will operate on two or three tons a year. It, and some companies, I know, even some high end companies will do one turn a year. Yeah, uh, and it's it just depends on the size of the company and um, and how much cash you want to invest into it. But it can be very expensive. So it's a, a struggle, and I'm still learning. Hmm. It, thank goodness that we actually hired somebody to run our company that knows what they're doing. I'm mostly just the guy who does the, the stereos and yeah. figures out stuff. But I mean, do you, as I say, grow out of your checkbook? So basically, income from, from, from sales is what you use to buy future parts. You're right. not relying on outside capital. Nope. No, we, we don't. We, we have outside capital through a line of credit available to us, but we pretty much fund everything ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we try to limit our growth to about seven to eight percent a year, nine percent if we're, you know, if mm -hmm. we're being aggressive, because if you grow too quickly, you'll outdo your cash and your ability yeah. to do things. So I, I mean, there's an, an, an apocryphal story, which I'm actually, I think it's true, that a company can be put out of business by a great review. Yes. Because what happens is, Great review creates demand, 
company is great. We have to have to invest a lot of money in parts to meet the increased demand. Six months later, when they're ready to build more, demand has dissipated because, you know, some reviews, they're like product of a month in yep. a sense. Yeah. And that can put a company out. A good review can put a company out of business. Absolutely. And, and further to that, the one thing I learned about when I was trying to learn the difference between profit and cash and it seems like if you have a lot of profit, you'd have a lot of cash, but that is not true. And you can, the companies typically go out of business at the point of their highest profitability. Mm -hmm. And that's because their, their growth is so rapid, maybe because of a review. Yeah. And they, oh, you know, they build all this stuff up and then, ah, and then you fall off the cliff because yeah. you run out of cash or, you know. So business is, is interesting. Yeah. Well, the wise companies... They don't go for a review at the beginning, immediately at the beginning of a product life cycle, <coughs> yeah. but they get the dealer network set up, they get all the beta testing done, they get it, the product is now established, then they get a review. Mm -hmm. that, that's the wise way to do it. I think you're probably right, and I, I believe we're, we could probably learn from that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've been as wise as we well, could, but, uh, but we try. Well, come on, and I will take you, follow us through this maze of stuff and we'll take you to so obviously music room one which many of you might have heard of through our youtube videos is located here in the in the warehouse as we go past boxes this these are all products that are finished and ready to go and in here come on in And these are the Infinity IRS-5. You don't see many of those. There were only 58 pair ever built. And I don't know which pair that I have, but they were made in 1985. They've got 36 tweeters, so 24 on the front, and then 12 more on the back that are out of phase to form a quasi-dipole. There's 12 EMIMs, which are dipoles, and if you, if you see these little jail cell bars here, these are actually the neodymium magnets. And there's, on both sides, if you try and take one of these apart, it, it'll blow apart like a Swiss watch. There's a hell of a lot of magnetic energy in these things. These wings on here, if you come around to the side, you can sort of see that the speaker is a panel. It's very thin. And these wings are a quarter wavelength of 100 hertz. And the idea is that sound launched off of here in one phase is not going to be able to wrap around and be canceled by the out of phase signal on the rear. So that's, that's why these actually exist. And they kind of look cool. So you can, if you can see back here, these are the woofers. There are six 12-inch woofers in each. They are servo-controlled. And on the back is a 1,500-watt power amplifier designed by Bascom King and Greg Shug of Monolithic Sound. It drives about a one-ohm load. It's, it's a big tunnel heat sink, which is kind of cool. This is the late Arnie Newdell's, I think, his, his statement product. Yes, yes, absolutely. And John, I think you and I had the same experience where uh, Harry Pearson's house was the first time, well, certainly the first time I ever heard them. Me too. That was the IRS 3. That was the IRS the 3. Version. Which looks, this, pretty much looks the same, but it had different drivers, if I remember right. I think it had different emits and certainly different woofers. Yeah. I see one thing you've done is you've replaced the original crossover with an outboard crossover. Right. The <clears throat> originally, all the crossover components were hot glued to the bottom of this fiberglass base. And over time, the capacitors, they use a lot of um, uh, bi uh, uh, electrolytics in there, and they all dried out and they lost half their capacitance. So instead of replacing them, we just simply built new crossovers using much the same value of parts, but different kites, like there's Mundorf's in here now, and Arnie Nudel, the, uh, unfortunately the late Arnie Nudel, uh, he and, and I conspired on if he was going to do it today, what parts he would use, and came up with that, and we built them into here. So that was kind of cool. 
And in fact, I can I can probably tell you a whole lot more about that. And I think John and I are going to sit down and have a, a, a real interview, and we can get into some depth on that if yeah, that sounds good. Yes, we can do that. In okay, a, in another video. All right. And um, just a few, some comments on the other products. Is this sure. is the new P20? Yep. This beast is the new P20 with a, a new some nice meters on the yeah front. what do you think <laughs> <laughs> that's your, your pro the result of your programmer's work yeah so you can oh it touch it's a touch panel. it's a touch too. panel so you can choose which meter you want to see up here is the big one and each one has a different function like this particular one is the distortion in and this particular one is the level of improvement mm -hmm. uh, that's a the improvement factor if you will and this one over here is the distortion out. And so you can choose which one you want to monitor all the time. I mean, it's, it's relatively useless stuff, but it is, it's, it's, it looks cool. It, it looks cool. It's good eye candy. Yeah. This is the crossover for the servo system. And there's a number of controls on here that you can see that operate the servo system, which rolls off at about 100 uh, hertz. And then uh, the the system is powered by twin BHK mono amplifiers. These P10 power plants down here, one for each of the servo systems. And then the whole thing is connected up by these long AudioQuest cables, which then go all the way back over here to our sources. And this rack is where we have our sources. And there's the BHK preamp the uh, direct stream memory player which is a you know cd player sacd player the dac and another p10 to power all of that and what is that a clear audio that's a clear table? audio turntable acting as a <coughs> rest for your ipod acting as a rest yeah i mean that how's that for poetry and no cartridge the one one of the problems of this thing is when the cartridge is sticking out sorry i mean to get in front of you when the cartridge is sticking out, people will come by and they're, yeah, and it, uh, we've already lost a couple of several thousand dollar cartridges from someone's sleeve ripping the cantilever out, and so that's been on hold for a minute. Um, and then this is sort of our library of CDs, library of albums, and um, I don't know if you want to talk about the construction of the room at all. Uh, well, yes, I mean... We came to it from the warehouse. Yeah. So these are so these are double walls. Okay. So we built first a structure and then built another structure within it. And there's an air gap of about six inches between mm -hmm. the two structures. And I, do you have closer spacing of the studs than normal? Yep. Yep. And they're offset. Now in the corner, Janner, if you put the camera up there, there's these, these sort of holy things what are those <laughs> well these were an attempt at a helmholtz resonator okay because when we measure a base trap a base trap exactly so these angled walls are completely filled up with fiberglass mm -hmm. and we blew it in from with a home depot device and then bob and i our, our engineer calculated what we would need to get rid of a specific frequency i don't remember what it was and uh, created those traps, the, the Helmholtz resonators, of which they worked about mm, nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, I think we lost maybe a dB out of a, like a 7 dB hump. So, fortunately, the, the two things were in our favor. I mean, that was a lot of work mm -hmm. doing all that. But fortunately, in our favor, two things. Where we set the chairs is right at a null so that it's not too bad. Right. And the second thing is that hump comes at a very pleasant point. And when I play something yeah. for you, like uh, the, the rudder re requiem, when the pipe organ comes in, it's very satisfying, right. even though it's a little exaggerated. So the only acoustic treatment I can see are the um, RPG panels, that presumably to disperse the back wave from yep. the speakers, yep. and some traps at the, at the back, and mm -hmm. some pan well, a panel at that first reflection point there. And but it's otherwise a very straightforward room. It's a very straightforward room. Really, the, the things that we did in here that really, really helped are those angled walls. We got rid of the corners mm -hmm. and we angled them. And that's something I've done now in two listening rooms to great advantage. And that has helped a lot with just, um, you know, if you... 
There's really no slap echo. And the other thing we did, there was a very quick slap echo, and we eliminated that by, by angling that corner in the ceiling. Oh, okay. That's, that's not just there for good looks. So that, there, there was a yeah. just a really quick, and we got rid of that with that angled. Um, and that's where I learned how to make angled cuts. <clears throat> and as you look at them, you can see what a terrible job I did. But, <laughs> but, but I tried. I had my little yeah. chop saw. And, and But this room. In the production line, in engineering, you have the audio precision analyzers. You have the audio precision analyzers. But this is the real measuring instrument you yes. have in your factory. Yes. This is where when when Bob or one of the other engineers says, I've made an adjustment or Ted Smith comes up with new firmware for the mm -hmm. DAC. This is where you say, OK, let's bring it in this room and exactly. see what difference we can have. As, as I think you, I like your phrase, you had called it our microscope. Yeah. And it, that's indeed what it is. Because the process we go through is uh, on our equipment and then th this equipment. And we've had a number of speakers in here in the past. All of them have sounded really good. But none have been as resolving and revealing as the IRS-5. Mm -hmm. And you can find fault in any system, but this system will show you immediately what has changed and that you can, that you can listen to. And it's one of the things I just, I, I love about it. And as we start going down the, the line of building speakers ourselves based on Arnie's designs, that'll be one of our challenges to yeah, see if right. we can make the same magnifiers. Well, I think, thanks Paul, I think this is a great point to stop this video and the next video will be on this room, the music, and your future plans. Thank you. It'll be my pleasure. Thank you, John.